OK. All right. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fass, please call the role of the board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Dr. Savoy. Yes. Ms. Harvey. Present. Ms. Lichter. Present. Thank you. Ms. Fass, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in the meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Dr. Wisted. Present. Dr. Wildridge. Present. Thank you. Okay, if there is any discussion, please put your notes in the chat and we will begin the meeting at this time. Um, Mr. Handy will give the introduction and the presentation will be by Dr. Wisted and Dr. Woolrich. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. So um, this afternoon, very happy to have some colleagues with me to present an overview of our advanced placement program, which also features a collaboration program called Equal Opportunity Schools. And I'll just say with no further delay, I'll turn it over to um, colleagues and we have Dr. Westhead and we also have uh, Dr. Waldridge presenting. So we can go um, to our next slide. Uh, Dr. Wildridge put this together to discuss our advanced placement program and then she'll talk briefly about um, equal opportunity schools. So Heather. Thank you, Dr. Wisted and Mr. Handy. Good afternoon. I'd like to start with um, the why of AP, right? Simon Sinek says, um, rarely do people care about what you do or how you do it until they understand why you do AP. And the Advanced Placement Program offers our high school students the opportunity to take college level course courses in their high schools taught by their teachers. These courses reflect what is taught in top introductory college courses. And at the end of the course, they have the opportunity to take an AP exam. And this course measures their mastery of the college level coursework. A score of three or higher on an AP exam can typically earn students college credit and or placement into advanced courses in college. Um, Mr. Corns, if you could go back to that previous slide, please. Thank you. Um, currently in BCPS, every single one of our high schools offer AP courses. Across the county, we offer 33 of the 37 available AP courses. AP courses are offered in math, science, social studies, English, computer science, world languages, art, and music. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, could you hit, um, yep, and one more time, please. Wonderful, thank you so much. So what you are seeing on the screen now, on the left are the BCPS fall of 2021 demographics for our overall high school population. And then on the right are the BCPS fall 2021 AP demographics. Um, so the, the high school students that are participating in advanced placement courses. Next slide, please. What you see here now on the left are our students uh, by demographics and how they score, whether a three or higher. So on uh, the first column are all of the students, and then you have our Asian students, our Black and African American students, our Hispanic students, our students who are two or more races, and then our white students. And then on the right side, you're looking at um, the first column is whether or not the students are English language learners. Yes would be the first column. No would be the second. 
in green you have um, the darker green are our farm students and the lighter green are our non farm students. And then um, in the more orange color, whether or not they're special ed, uh, the darker orange is yes and the lighter orange is no. Next slide, please. We are working very hard in this district to um, level the playing field, to ensure that there is equitable access to advanced placement courses in all of our high schools for all of our students. We want to um, remove barriers um, to applications, so we have um, removed the um, requirement for teacher recommendations. We've um, lifted the barrier of the exam fees. This year we are paying for the first AP exam for every student and we will continue to support and cover the fees for uh, students who are currently farms. Um, in terms of Equal Opportunity Schools, we are in a partnership currently with three high schools, Catonsville High School, Milford Mill Academy, and Perry Hall High School. They are all in their second year of engaging in equity work with equity, excuse me, Equal Opportunity Schools. Their mission is to strengthen educator and system leader capacity to break down barriers in order to increase access, belonging, and success in rigorous college and career preparation secondary school courses for students of color and low income students so that they may thrive in their post-secondary pursuits and life goals. Between 2021 and 2022, and this current school year, enrollment of students of color in AP courses at those three schools increased an average of 5.6%. Uh, we also have been working, um, in addition to partnering with Equal Opportunity Schools, we have been partnering with College Board. Currently in the month of March, we have Achieving Equity in Advanced Placement Workshops. We are partnering with College Board to provide workshops for AP coordinators and additional staff at each high school. The workshops are designed to help staff disaggregate their AP data and create action plans to increase access and opportunities for students of color to take AP courses and sit for their end of course AP exams and score three or higher. We also are continuing our tradition of sponsoring the participation of AP teachers and other high school teachers in the Advanced Placement Summer Institute. This is a uh, about a four to five day workshop, depends on if it's online or face to face, uh, that is offered by Goucher College through College Board. The, the Goucher College Wor Summer Institute is the closest to BCPS, and so we prefer to send our teachers there so we don't have to pay um, hotel costs and per diem, et cetera. Um, and this year we are offering in addition to the Advanced Placement Summer Institute workshops, we are also providing content specific workshops uh, during our advanced, uh, excuse me, during our professional study day in August. We're offering 15 of those. So we are very excited about the equity work that we are engaging in with advanced placement um, in conjunction with the work that we are doing with dual enrollment. Next slide, please. Any questions? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, we can hear you. Dr. is okay. Um, all right. Well, it's okay yes. if I'm yes. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. all right. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, it's it's uh, good to hear that at the schools that are participating in the Equal Opportunity Schools that you've increased. Um, participation by students of color by 5%. Those, can you tell me those three schools again really quickly? Yes, ma'am. Catonsville High School, Milford Mill Academy, and Perry Hall High School. Okay, and then if you could go back to slide two. The next one, I'm sorry. <laughs> slide three. <laughs> So when you look at this slide and you, you look at the differences between population and participation in AP, that's what this is showing. Am, am I seeing that right? You see that um, 
African American and Hispanic students are not at parity with uh, their population and that white and Asian students are above parity. And I'm wondering, part of the work that you do is removing barriers. And I understand removing the fee and removing the teacher recommendations. What other barriers have you identified uh, that are barriers to achieving parity with students of color attending AP, participating in AP courses? Thank you for that question. I think um, one of the biggest barriers is culture. Um, in our district, it's um, the culture of AP is reflective of the demographics that you see on our screen. And so we are working to change teacher mindset, coordinator mindset, and student mindset. Uh, we want to make sure that students, all students, understand the benefits of participating in advanced placement courses. For example, students who just simply take an AP course are more likely to attend and complete a four-year, attend a four-year college and complete a degree. Students who take the AP course and sit for the AP course end of year exam, regardless of how they score, are even more likely to attend a four-year college and uh, um, earn that degree. And then, of course, the research shows that students who score three or higher are even the most uh, likely. So really um, showing students that just by putting their their foot in the door, right, and, and putting their high knees in that seat and and just sitting in the class gives them a greater opportunity of pursuing uh, post-secondary education. Also showing um, really supporting the teachers in terms of strategies for um, teaching students in classes of rigor in a way that supports them and coaches them up rather than leaving them in the dust. So strategies for uh, focused note taking, teaching them how to take notes so that um, they are retaining the content and they're able to recall that content and, and perform higher on exams, teaching them about um, test taking strategies, you know, the social emotional um, component of taking a test. test. Test taking can be very stressful for, for some students and adults, right? And so we want to help our teachers teach our students how to deal with that social emotionally um, so that they can perform their best on, on their end of course exams. So I could keep going on, I, I, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll pause well, here. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like for you to dig a little bit deeper because I am interested. I, I agree that culture is one of the biggest barriers to achieving more participation in AP. And the three things you mentioned were all, the first three things you mentioned were all about mindset, uh, specifically teacher mindset, coordinator mindset, and student mindset. So can you speak to what are the specific barriers? Like what about teachers' mindsets creates a barrier, about coordinator mindsets and student mindsets that create barriers, and what is the work that the system is doing to break down those barriers? So I can uh, address some of that, and, and Doug, you can certainly chime in as well as far as what the system is doing overall, but you know, it, it's no secret that um, a lot of the staff in BCPS has bias. Um, and so that's something that a, as, you know, leaders we've been working with, uh, you know, the equity wor work began when I was a principal. Um, and it, it's something that we've been addressing for at least 10 or more years. So Doug, I don't know if you want to share some other details okay. about um, how we're addressing it with the PLCs and the feeder pattern PLCs. D sure. Doug, if oh. Okay. Yeah, Dr. McComas, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, um, I can share directly that, you know, as a high school administrator uh, and, and a department chair, part of the challenge is getting our teachers to understand, oftentimes teachers, um, when they are teaching the advanced placement classes, right, they believe fundamentally that the students need to already be performing at that college level, right? Um, and to Heather's point, getting them to understand that, no, we are not uh, college professors, and we are high school teachers, and our job is to get our students to that level of readiness through exposure and support. So I just want to like kind of really 
crystallize that in my direct experience as a high school administrator and a, a department chair who actually had conversations with high school teachers around um, what what our role is and what our role is not right clarifying for them that it's not that they already need to be performing at that college level this is about getting them there and our work is to build their capacity to perform well at that level so i just i just wanted to share like specifically what that's like what that conversation how that conversation can unfold um in in one-on-one -on -one conversations across school systems um i, I think part of the work is you know interestingly enough we collectively as a society understand in athletics when we say we need kids to level up right we need them to play at that next competitive group right we we work hard to get kids into travel sports right because we know playing with that more competitive group is going to build their skills faster and hone their capacity uh, we need to somehow help people translate that same mindset into academic performance right and um, so i just wanted to kind of give some anecdotal experiences with that and then certainly thank you um mr handy for allowing me to kind of share firsthand experience in coaching teachers around um what it is that we we need to do um and then you can talk extensively about the work that we've been doing to help people unpack that bias and what what is it that they're holding on to that are is leading to gatekeeping for, for, for our kids so thanks for the opportunity to add yeah thank you dr mccombs and um, i guess just to um, continue along with really where dr wilder started and dr west said um and then dr mccombs's comments um dr wilder made a comment i think i'm gonna paraphrase around you know, I guess teachers might have a belief about what an AP student looks like. And Ms. Harvey, you mentioned, let's go back to the data slide. Thank you for doing that. I believe that there are teachers who believe that AP students are either white or Asian, and that black and Hispanic students by and large do not fit their model what AP student looks like. So there's the idea of giving black and Hispanic students, um, black and Hispanic students access to AP and then a lot of the discussion we had was around the supports necessary to make sure every student is successful. And for whatever reason, a teacher in AP class might engage with the student and find out that the learning style is not what that teacher is used to. And if they believe that AP is taught just like college and that there's no need to engage a student in a particular way, then that could give a student who has access to the course really not the support that student needs to be successful in the course. And that's where the professional learning that Dr. Wooldridge comes in um, around specifically with AP. And then what my team and I do, and we'll talk about a little later this afternoon, is really trying to address the mindsets. You know, as Dr. Westhead talked about, some people call it the hearts and minds approach. And it really is about each of us looking at our own identity and how that inter identity interacts with the students in our classes. Um, and if that's the case, you know, if there is a teacher who has a different racial identity than the student, um, there could be a cultural divide there. You could have a racial identity that matches the student and still have a cultural divide. Uh, but it really is about getting to know students and about what um, is necessary to help students become successful. Um, and if I think about how AP was presented years ago and the work that um, has been done to make AP more inclusive, that's really where we've been focusing to try to get um, teachers really to meet students where they are and help bring them along to be successful, understanding again that um, there could be um, some differences in how that teacher is used to approaching students and this student might need different needs to be successful right so i, I appreciate that uh clear that distinction around what may be happening uh in the classroom i'm, I'm going to continue to push the conversation because i really want to get at how we're moving forward uh as a system because we all know as was stated that participation in AP uh, improves your academic and just your future in general, your academic mm -hmm. course and your future in general. So how do kids get access to AP? I'm sorry, students, how do students get access to AP? Ms. Harvey, if mm -hmm. I could uh, join in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so so thank you for that question. And so I, I think what everyone has been talking about is our culture of high expectations. And so specifically about what we've been doing in the system is the teaching and learning framework that came out a few years ago. The number one priority is that culture of high expectations for all students. Um, in terms of how do students receive access, 
that starts all the way back to elementary school. And when we're looking at the data across schools, we're finding that the students that receive access to compacted math, for example, in the fourth and fifth grades, those uh, students across the board don't represent the same demographics um, as our entire student population. So as you move up and you're talking about compacted math and you're talking about GT learning, then you talk about honors and AP or IB in the high school, you're going to see uh, graphs that are similar to what's posted here. And so what have we done this year? This year we've kind of shifted our equity focus. So it's not only about student sense of belonging and creating a goal around belonging. We also have a literacy goal and a math goal where the school teams are charged with looking at your student performance overall, but looking at your student performance by student group and creating an actual goal about how you're going to not only improve um, access to the course because we know experience matters, but also when the students get there, what kind of supports are you going to put in place so that they are successful the whole way through? Um, I would say that that is uh, some of the key piece of the new work that we're doing. And uh, specifically, we launched in PLD. Um, Doug, help me, it might have been two meetings ago, this focus on mathematics across all clusters where we had all principals in a room, all levels, and what they did is they went to their feeder high school, which is not 100% clean, you know, because some schools are split. They went to their feeder high schools and they looked at how many sections of Algebra 1 do you offer at that feeder high school? Because that sends a message, because it's not only about the high school, the high school you end up in algebra as a result of some of the experiences that you've had in elementary school and middle school. And they started opening up that conversation as a whole group in the room around, you know, what are the implications for that? How can they work together vertically um, to make some improvements in terms of what students come to the high school with? But then I think Doug has an opportunity to talk about what they've been doing as each equity PLC by cluster this semester as a you know specifically around math looking at that one data point to see what it means for students and increasing that trajectory so these graphs don't look so lopsided that's going to be work that takes you know more than a semester to do but i think he can speak to some specifics about what that work looks like and right. what the goal is so i appreciate uh the work of getting upstream on this and preparing children early in their career. But there are kids in high school today, kids who are entering high school come September. If they want to take an AP course, and that's another conversation, how do they access AP courses? So all students should be able to access them through the scheduling um, session. So I uh, believe, Heather, and you can confirm that there are no longer those barriers where they need a recommendation. A student can, every year when it's time to sign up for a class, can identify on their um, selections which classes they're interested in. Yes, ma'am. OK, and and tell me, what, what are students saying about AP? We're, we're talking about this one slide is about participation and we have lower rates of participation in AP and I wonder um, because of the mindsets that we discuss th the bias that you all have acknowledged in the system um, I wonder what students are saying about even considering AP uh, are those things preventing or prohib giving students pause in taking AP and how are two questions how are we addressing that and two if a student is in an ap class particularly underrepresented students and they are feeling the bias experiencing the bias in the class what recourse do they have how do they know about that recourse and how confident do you believe students to be that they will use those options so Heather, I'm going to let you start and I'll follow up by my experiences in the high schools working with the principals. Sure, I, I really thank you for the opportunity and I really appreciate those questions. So the, the first thing is what we're finding um, is that students who, who feel the bias and 
do not want to participate in AP, they are taking advantage of our dual enrollment programs. And I wish I could pull the slide up for you that we just showed um, high school principals yesterday. Um, the demographics of the students who are participating in dual enrollment are completely the flip of what you see right now. So we have almost double the number of African American students participating, almost double the number of Hispanic students. We still have a high uh, number of Asian students participating in dual enrollment. Um, but uh, the numbers for white students are, are, are much less. So the students who are feeling, some of the students who are feeling that bias are taking advantage of our dual enrollment um, opportunities, which is actually even more fiscally um, beneficial to them because currently in BCPS, we are paying for all courses and books and tuition for dual enrollment courses. Um, in terms of what, uh, uh, Another thing that I will add is that we are on the cusp of a large uh, uh, a paradigm shift right now because the College Board itself has recently started coming out and saying that we recognize, they, College Board, recognizes that the pressure that students who are enrolled in AP courses feel is detrimental to their mental health. And so College Board itself has actually come out with a press release, and I have directly heard it from their leaders multiple times in the past six months. They are no longer recommending that students take more than five AP courses in their high school career. So I think we're on this cusp of a paradigm shift because as we communicate that with our community and as we as a system shift from being very AP central and AP focused to opening up the three pathways that are, um, that are being made available through Blueprint, um, AP courses and IB courses, in is one path make up one pathway, dual enrollment ma makes up a second pathway, and CTE courses courses make up a third pathway, we're going to see students taking advantage of course offerings that provide them with not only college preparatory, but career preparatory options that fit their unique um, skills and abilities and interests and goals for the future. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Yarborough, did you want to respond or? Sure, um, and I think two parts of your question, um, uh, Vice Chair Harvey, you asked how are students feeling around AP? Um, I, I think it's no secret that students feel that AP courses are challenging. Um, they feel it's a lot of work, uh, particularly at the high school level, that they're going to have to sacrifice something um, in order to do well in the AP, and sometimes, um, you know, depending on what year the student is, what their additional responsibilities are or competing interests, they may make a, de they may make a decision um, to participate in AP or not to participate in AP. Uh, there are also some students in some communities that feel, as uh, my colleagues have shared before, that AP classes are for certain types of students. And so it's our responsibility to uh, make sure that they know that we're ready to embrace all students. You also asked what are their recourse if they're feeling a certain way when they're in the class. And I think um, first our hope is that they're able to communicate directly with the teacher, but if they're feeling uncomfortable uh, you know, in the teacher's class, every uh, teacher has a department chair that's available to speak to the student. And then there are grade level administrators at the uh, high school level and specific counselors where t students can go. Um, I think if your question is, if every student across Team BCPS high schools is aware that these are the steps that they can take, um, if they're not feeling comfortable, uh, that's definitely a conversation that we can have with our principals, and uh, there's definitely an opportunity for us to uh, make sure that that information is broadly known, not only to the students, but to their families in terms of if they're in an AP class and they need some additional support, what are some other options? Thank you. OK. Ms. Harvey, anything else? I have no further questions. I appreciate all of your responses. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for contributing to that uh, productive discussion. And now we'll go to overview of equity. Are, have we completed that, everything that we needed to complete and advance in the AP program? 
we did uh, just about Dr. Savoy. I just want to make one more comment um, in response to Dr. Savoy's, I'm sorry, to Ms. Harvey's question. Um, Ms. Harvey, just one other aspect of Equal Opportunity Schools that I would like to see us um, scale up. Uh, we did gather data um, around what you just discussed. You, you asked how do students feel about AP, and the data did show, you know, through interviews and surveys, students were saying they perceive AP as, as very difficult or too difficult or I wouldn't be successful. And part of the EOS work is matching up the student with a trusted adult in the building. So even before the student would enroll for an AP course, they know they have an adult who is there to support them and trying to pursue an AP pathway if they choose to do so. Um, and then if they run the difficulty in that class, in addition to the teacher and the department chair, you know, as uh, Dr. Yarbrough mentioned, there is that trusted adult who already uh, had stated that they are there to support the student. They believe the student can be successful. So those are some of the supports that are also available uh, to disrupt some of the patterns we've been talking about. OK, um, Ms. Littner has a question. Um, and it was to what you were saying, um, Dr. D. So besides for the um, mentor or the person that the, the child is attached to, what are the what makes it a equal opportunity school? Like what are the other things in place? And if you already said some of this, I might have missed it, but what are the other things that are in place that makes a school an equal opportunity access school? So thank you, Ms. Lecter. I'm actually going to invite Dr. Woldridge in. So I I, I was able to go to a, a visit um, to to try to fill in a cover. Um, for, for Dr. Woldridge at one point, but Dr. Woldridge is our, our expert. I do have some connection as well, but I'll let Dr. Woldridge start, please. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Uh, so Equal Opportunity Schools is a partnership. That it's a it's a company, so it's not that, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a company that we're partnering with and we are using, with their support, we are using their tools. Uh, Mr. Handy described one of them. It's um, a survey that goes out to all students about their perception of advanced placement, their perception of the culture of the school. That same survey actually goes out to this, the staff as well, um, asking them questions such as, um, do you feel that all students should have access to AP? Um, things like that. And, it, and then we have a program manager that meets with the equal opportunities equity teams four times a year to the first quarter we look at the enrollment data okay so what um how did the work that we did last year impact the enrollment of of students in ap the second meeting we look at the results of those surveys and then we make up an action plan to target the students who feel like they're interested that express in the surveys that they're interested in AP but may not be taking advantage of it at that time. Um, they make an action plan for recruiting for giving students an opportunity to go into advanced placement courses um, and sit in one to experience what it would be like would be like partnering them with um, student mentors that are in AP courses uh, so they can start feeling more comfortable and a part of that community uh, partnering them with teachers and administrators if they um, indicated that they didn't feel like they had a trusted adult and um, making sure that the the teachers who are listed as trusted adults know that they have been and so um, they know the impact that they're making um, and then uh, looking at um, preparations for recruitment for the next year so it's an ongoing cycle it is a three-year cycle that we go through um, Equal Opportunity Schools, one of the things that I appreciate about them most says that they're not in the business of um, continuing the partnership. They're in the business of getting the schools into the place where their recruitment and um, open access policy is working and thriving and students have equal opportunities. And, and so they're not they're in the business of, of you know, losing jobs <laughs> because then they'll they'll pull out and they'll go fill a need at another school. So um, Equal Opportunities is is truly a partnership and we have a program manager manager that supports us in, in, in the work and it is the work that the school staff is doing. It sounds like our equity work, so it's just interesting that it's an outside provider that's doing it. Do we have any schools besides for those three that saw like a 5% gain or anywhere near that? I mean. So 
that's an interesting question. I do feel that we have schools. Um, I don't have those specific numbers off the top of my head, but I could certainly pull them. Um, I do feel that our schools have had similar increases this year because um, there was a uh, like a, a rebound effect after COVID, right? Our numbers went down during COVID, and this year was a year where kids had been in school most of the year last year, and they um, were feeling more comfortable about more rigorous courses. And so, um, if I may speak speak freely, um, one school had a 3% increase, one school had a 4% increase, which I think is on par with the rest of the county, and another school had a 10% increase, which is why we had a 5.6% average. Um, and that's Milford Mill was the school that had the 10% increase, and I do believe it was because they were one of two schools in Baltimore County that were selected across the nation to pilot the new African American AP studies course. Um, and so I don't really feel like that is an accurate representation of an increase because it was a new course. Okay. Ms. Lecter, could I, could I add as well? So I agree with you. It, it is an extension of our equity work or part of it. And if, going back to what Dr. Yarbrough shared about our PLC work and having schools work in feeder patterns, as she stated, this year we are looking at Algebra 1 as a focal point. Um, we had feed, we had our PLC work before COVID, so we kind of brought it back this year, and we plan to continue to work in these PLCs. And if a school looks at a focal area and it's AP access and success in AP, then they can work within that feeder pattern um, to to work on that as well. So I just want to say, even you know, as Dr. Wooldridge mentions, if if we no longer partner with EOS, we still have opportunities to continue this work, as you stated, Ms. Lichter, because it is certainly um, it is our equity work. You're exactly right. Just want to. Or it's agreement and a plan. I mean, it would be interesting, not now, I know it's not part of this, but um, something that um, Dr. Woolworth said before, which is, you know, the AP track takes you somewhere, but we have other, and I know tracks always gotten a bad rap, but I don't, I mean, we have other tracks too, you know, the CCB, the dual, you know, the dual enrollment, there's a lot of other paths. So it'd be interesting sometimes to look at which of our kids are on which paths and which of our kids are on no, or on no path. So, um, you know, I think as AP, like in, especially what you're saying about College Board coming out and advocating at some point five as the limit, we may see a decline because of that. But that doesn't mean that our kids aren't in another track that's preparing them for a career or for college or for whatever's next. So I think it's important that we keep those numbers, too, um, because I think we have some really good other programs besides for AP. Um, our certification programs and things like that. So I think it's important that we get the whole picture sometimes and not just, you know, the AP um, piece, if that makes sense. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you, Ms. Littner. Okay, Ms. Harvey's hand was up. You had another question? Just a quick uh, request. If we could uh, stop, or if we could spell out our acronyms and our vernacular, for the public that's participating and observing this meeting so that they know what PLUs are and AP is and all of those things, that would be helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Is anybody going to do it? <laughs> uh, well, so I think I use, I use the acronym PLC. That's the professional learning community. I believe that was the one I used. Okay. Uh, we've been saying EOS, which is Equal Opportunity Schools, and of course, AP is Advanced Placement. Um, Thank you, Ms. Harvey. I try to be mindful of that. A lot of edgy speak. We know we do that. Thank you. The, okay. Mr. Douglas? Yes, thank you, Dr. Savoy. So I want to thank my colleagues from CNI for the presentation. Um, thank you and the committee members for the discussion. So at this time, um, I would like to excuse the colleagues from CNI and then we'll go into the next part of our discussion. So thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. At this time, we will have an overview of equity training in Baltimore County Public Schools. All right. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Um, so this afternoon, um, I will present an overview of the system-wide equity training that the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency has developed. The version of the training that I will present consists of 10 hours of professional learning, which may be experienced either in person or virtually. This school year, training has been and will be facilitated by me the four equity specialists on my staff, and eight members of the Teacher Equity Academy, which my staff formed to expand our training capacity. 
This year, equity training participants have included the members of the superintendent's cabinet, executive directors from all departments, including the Department of Schools, and central office leaders selected by superintendent's cabinet, and all principals and assistant principals. Additionally, school-based equity liaisons have recently started participating in the training, which they will conclude by the end of the school year. Training will be available to additional staff members during the 2023-2024 school year. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this training course, which we have named Engaged Why Equity, we discuss BCPS's or Baltimore County Public Schools Policy 0100 Equity. And we discuss and apply the COMPASS Four Agreements and Conditions 1 and 2 of the Courageous Conversations about Race Protocol. We also develop a shared vocabulary based on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and do some deep reflection and identity work. The course heavily incorporates conversation, and we use many small groups and breakout rooms to facilitate our discussions. For that reason, active participation is crucial. Next slide, please. So equity lenses are essential, but are not the only part of equity work. Even if you have an equity lens, you can't resolve issues without the right discussions. Glenn Singleton is the creator of Courageous, the Courageous Conversations About Race Protocol. He developed it after noticing that people, specifically white people, have a difficult time talking about race in an explicit and intentional way. The purpose of the protocol is to reach mutual understanding rather than sway anyone's opinion. The CCAR protocol contains the compass, agreements, and conditions, each adding a layer of depth to the conversation. This course focuses on tier one, which are the tools and conditions one and two. Tier one is designed to engage us in the conversation through our own personal racial experiences, beliefs, and perspectives, while acknowledging the historical and contemporary local and immediate racial context. Next slide, please. In Engage Why Equity, we cover the compass, agreements, and the first two conditions, which are, again, the engaged level. Conditions three and four include information to help us sustain the conversation, and conditions five and six include resources to help us deepen the conversation. Next slide, please. To allow time for self-reflection for each participant and to facilitate conversations among participants, we have developed the four C's. The four C's are prompts that let participants know how they will engage and process each concept that is introduced in the course. During my presentation this afternoon, I will provide examples of the four C's and context. So you see the four C's on the screen along with uh, the icons we use. And again, I'll revisit those a little later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So we use the compass to navigate all the complex emotions, opinions, beliefs, et cetera, that may come up in a conversation about race. In Singleton's research, he came to the conclusion that people typically enter a conversation from one or multiple quadrants on the compass. In other words, we enter the conversation morally, intellectually, relationally, and or emotionally. When we can understand from where we are entering a conversation about race, we can speak more intentionally about race. And when we can understand from where others are entering into a conversation about race, we can more effectively reach mutual understanding. Next slide, please. So we start with the believing space. This is related to the body and our morals and traditions. In this space, we are responding to a racial event based on our perception of right and wrong. It's typically a gut feeling or a somewhat instinctual feeling. Next slide, please. In the thinking space or the mind, our responses to a racial issue or information may be characterized by personal disconnect with the subject or to search for more information or data. Our intellectual response is often verbal and based in our best thinking. Next slide, please, thank you. The acting space or relational is where we connect and respond to racial information through actions and behaviors. 
And then lastly, the feeling space or the heart. This is where we respond to information through feelings. When racial issues strike us at a physical level and cause an internal sensation, sensation such as anger, sadness, joy, or embarrassment, make sure you are able to correctly name the emotion you are feeling, whether that emotion invites you to lean into connection or disconnection, and what needs arise when you experience these emotions. Next slide, please. All right, so this time I'm going to invite the committee members to participate in a segment of our training, and you can see how our participants actually interact with um, in our training session. So this is actually uh, straight from Engage again. So we start with BCPS policy 0100, and we usually start with a check-in asking uh, what participants know about the equity policy, and we gather their feedback, um, and then we go a little deeper into the policy. So we ask them what they know about the policy, then we ask them when have they applied the policy to their work in BCPS. And we use the same prompt regardless of the role that the participant plays in BCPS, because as we know, Policy 0100 applies to every single BCPS employee. And then we're going to take this work and um, bring it the compass into the work as well. All right, so what I'm going to ask you all to do as committee members, I'm going to ask you all to Access Policy 0100. Um, if hopefully you have it nearby, you can get it on your computer. I do have some slides with the policy, um, but I'd like you to take some time um, and read the policy. And I'm talking about just the um, philosophy section. So this is the, the first section, if you will, of the policy. And go through and highlight or underline any word, phrase, sentence, or section that stands out to you, okay? And what we typically do is ask you to hold on to that and then partner you up so you can have a discussion. Now, since we're a small group, I'm going to ask you to do this individually. So, again, just go through the policy. And then, Mr. Corns, if you could go one slide further just um, to illustrate. So, we're looking at just the, the equity statement section, okay? So, it's uh, A, B, C, and D um, of, of the equity policy. So, we're looking at really the top of that section. So, if you go through, take a look, and just um, I'll wait um, for a couple minutes. Um, just to give you a chance to highlight or underline anything that resonates with you in the policy. Okay. Are there any questions on uh, what we're going to do? All right. And while you all do that, we'll just look at the next slide so you can see the next section. So this is um, B and C of that same section. Okay, and then on our next slide, we have uh, section D. So if there are any committee members that would like us to move amongst these slides to get to a certain section that you can read on the screen, we can do that as well. Just let us know. Yeah, so take about another minute uh, to wrap up your notes, and then we'll move forward to do some reflection on this and some discussion.
Okay. All right, let's move on to the next slide and discuss um, some of what you encountered. So again, we would typically do this in a pair of conversations. So you see the connection icon, and that will be the prompt to um, connect with an elbow partner. If you're in a face-to-face -face environment, if we're doing this in a virtual environment, then we would create breakout rooms and have um, participants work in pairs. So I would like um, to see if we can have some folks share what word, phrase, sentence, or section did you find significant to you and your role? And when you share, I'm gonna ask that you bring in some of our new learning, if you will, for some, um, but bring the compass in as well. So let me know um, that word, phrase, sentence, or section, and then share please where it puts you on the compass. And then I want you to talk about why you're in that quadrant of the compass. Right, do we have a volunteer to go first? I can go first. Oh, this will be a good activity for new teacher orientation too. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, and it's interesting because I've done this with the new teachers and listening to what they're saying versus now me trying to do it. What <laughs> I I'm in the thinking quadrant um, and I usually do go there, but it's written from the perspective of adults, not which I like, not students. It's not expecting what students have to do to make this happen, but us as adults. So, you know, we saw you know, recognizing and removing um, the barriers, providing all students with opportunities. So it really was written from the perspective of what we as the adults need to do to make this happen versus things that you might read that talks about what the child or the student needs to do. Um, so I, you know, I, when I read it through that lens, there were a lot of sentences and phrases that did talk about it, um, you know, ensuring that social identifications are not obstacles. So. Um, that was an interesting, it's different than I read it before. So I don't know whether it's in this role where I've got to look broader and, and down, whether um, that that's why it stuck out to me. And then the, the other two words that are over and over again are every and all. So every time it was, I used it myself, but each time it was um, applicable, you know, it was very intentional that it, every student, all students was put in there for that emphasis. Thank you, Ms. Lecter. I appreciate okay. you for getting us started. Uh, do we have another volunteer that wants to share? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Harvey put in for comment. Sorry, and I saw us. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harvey. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think the there were many phrases that stood out for me. I think the phrase of uh, the school system must, and that particular word I believe is important and powerful, must address and overcome inequity by providing all students with the opportunity to succeed. And so I, I, I think I'm in the, the acting, part of the compass. Uh, I am looking for, I say this all the time, I think that we should make the thing we want people to do the easiest thing for them to do. And so I am seeking uh, when we have these conversations and as I talk to people and observe practices in the system, what are the things that we are doing that I can point to and say, oh, that's, that's equity work right there. That's equity in action right there. Uh, the statement talks about removing barriers. So it's not just, um, you know, like that picture where you have the three students and they get different size boxes so they can see over the fence. The barrier is the fence. And so removing barriers in our system that um, discourage kids from even trying AP classes, for example, that uh, make it difficult for parents to access services. Uh, those kinds of things I am looking to see um, more easily accessible um, and clearly stated in our system. And I think that's that's the work that I'm engaging in as part of this board and as part of this committee in particular. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. So um, just a couple of things I heard you say. Number one, um, when I, I, I pretty much live in protocol. Um, in my role, and I heard you talk about you being in the acting space, and you talked about the actions that you will take and in your role on the board, what you will push for. 
I also heard you say, you know, that word must. You said, I believe that word is very strong. So I, I also, you entered in that believing space. So what I've learned, it allows me to know your level of, I guess, conviction or how strongly you hold on to uh, what you're what you're saying. That's that's a that's part of your moral fiber, if you will. So I heard you start there, and then you talk about how you will take that into action. Um, so thank you for what you've shared. Um, I believe that the cops can be a powerful tool because I think you know what you shared is your your belief, um, the actions you're taking. And you might find someone that reads that passage and, and might not react in that same way. And again, so we're trying to find some understanding. I also want to go back to what Ms. Lichter shared about how, how she read the statement in her previous role. Um, she read it a little differently. I'm paraphrasing again, Ms. Lichter. She read it a little differently um, than where she read it this evening. So I'd be curious as to, you know, where were you in the compass at that point, say, years ago versus today? Um, and, you know, there's a lot we can talk about, a lot we can unpack with that as well. So uh, I'm going to pause to see if we um, want to put Dr. Savoy on the spot, but we've got Dr. Savoy. I don't know if anyone else wants to um, give comment before we move on. Yeah, can move on. Okay. All right. So, all right, you said move on, Dr. Savoy? You okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, let's move on to our next slide, please. All right, so again, um, I'm going back into, so thank you all for participating. So I wanted you all to get um, a flavor of what we were doing. So again, this is straight from our current curriculum um, that we're moving, um, that we're using with our school-based equity liaisons. We also have a cadre um, with our um, peer assistance and review teachers, our consulting teachers, um, which their work, of course, is critical to helping our new teachers grow into um, our experienced teachers. So um, just to let you know, this work is, is very wide ranging. So at this point, we would come as a whole group back into community. Uh, we would ask, you know, so we know Ms. Lichter and Ms. Harvey shared out. So we would say, you know, what was it like? Um, let's say the two of you were working in pairs. We'd ask you, you know, what was it like um, talking in conversation using this courageous conversation about race compass? And then, you know, what resonated with you after engaging the conversation? So you get a chance to talk in small groups or in pairs. Um, and then we would share out in a, in a whole group. So again, we're trying to build community through our whole experience. Um, and then, you know, again, we want folks to share their experience and not share the details of what was shared with them. So we try to get folks to um, speak for themselves, frankly, and that's a big part of our training as well. All right, so um, let's move on to the next slide and then we will get ready to wrap up. All right, so I just wanna share this briefly and then uh, we'll close or, you know, I'll turn to you all for questions. But we also talk about how to use the compass to tender conversations. The first thing you do is locate yourself, find out what quadrant you're entering in. You try to get centered um, to get in touch with your own um, being, if you will. And then you look to see where someone else is coming into the conversation. Once you've done that, then you move into step four and you try to meet folks where they are, again, with the, the goal to reach that mutual understanding. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so again, just wanted to give you a little flavor um, of the training that we do. Um, and at this point, I'll see if you all have any questions or comments um, before I turn it back to Dr. Savoy. Anybody have questions or comments? My only comment is I went through this training years ago and it truly, and I'll say as a white woman, um, keeping it local, immediate, and personal. It really um, was tough, tough training, but changed the way I approached my work with principals dramatically. Um, so it's wonderful, um, difficult training, but it takes a long time. Like it was probably the only training I had that was not nowhere near one and done. It takes mm -hmm. over and over and over um, you know, to get it there. And that's what makes it so hard. Um, you know, knowing that we're doing the same thing kind of again is because we lose teams or the teams, you know, disintegrate and it is such a lot of PD. So um, I know it's a it's a struggle at times, but I appreciate you continuing the work and your office continuing the work. Thank you, Ms. Lecter. I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your experience with the work, but thank you for your comments. I, I just had uh, one, uh, I mirror Chair Lichter's 
comments uh, about just the work and acknowledging how difficult it is, but also how important it is. And I, I wonder, I know that this happens in cycles through the system in terms of training uh, in the professional development. Uh, how, how is progress measured? Mm. So um, I'll, Dr. Yarbrough, do you want me to start? Uh, <laughs> and Dr. Yarbrough and I have had several conversations about this. I think, first of all, our equity work, ultimately, our system is about student achievement. And it's about student achievement for each student. So to me, the ultimate measure is not seeing the, the, um, the gaps that we see, um, not seeing um, disproportionality and suspension rates, not having predictable data. Um, so that's when we are um, successful. We know this is a journey. I don't know where this will look like by the time, you know, I've moved on. Um, but that's that's the ultimate measure, I believe, um, Ms. Harvey. We, we've got to see each student being successful. And we should not be able to predict that, you know, our AP has, you know, um, you know, lower enrollment for our Black and Hispanic students and for our white and Asian students. Like we said, there should like those things should not exist. So to me, that's the ultimate measure, I guess, on the quantitative data. And then um, the qualitative data is, I guess, it's about student experiences, their belongingness, and their, you know, it's got to be a positive experience. Like we, we talk about high expectations we talked about before. We The students should feel cared for and be successful academically. To me, that's what we're here for. Yes. But what's interesting is I just came from the curriculum committee meeting before this meeting. Um, and this is the answer to so many discussions. Like we were talking in the curriculum committee and one of the um, board members was talking about, you know, why have our score, why are our scores showing what they're showing? Like, you know, what is it? Like, because we want to all solve the problem, but it is a culture of low expectations because of the biases that our predominantly white teaching force brings to the classrooms. No ill will or no male intent usually, but I mean, I've witnessed it. I, I've seen teachers call on kids, reinforce kids differently. Um, so it, it's so much of the work and it's also so many of the reasons why in meeting after meeting, we could talk about the AP, we could talk about the curriculums we pick. I mean, every committee that I'm in, I feel like this this is the work. It's the question is like, we shouldn't have an equity committee. Like the fact that we are sitting here as a separate committee is like counter intuitive to the work should be embedded in in every committee and everything that we're doing. And that's what the training did for me. It made me look through that lens. I don't know how we do it because when it started way back in 2013 or whatever, it did start with the board. That was the first group of people that got trained using Singleton's approach. So it's just something for us to think about as a board. You know, there's only three of us on here right now, but is this training that our whole board should go through because, you know, um, to Ms. Harvey's point, as we look at data, behind the data is the bias, it is the low expectations, and it is why everything we pull up has our white kids over here and our kids of color here. So it's just something to, just something to think about because I feel like this is still a silo and it, we're not going to move until it's not a silo and it permeates through everything else. Uh, Ms. Lecter, I'm in agreement, and I think, you know, the, the plain language in which you spoke about the problem to me is step one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it has to be acknowledged in that plain language you just stated it in. And, you know, like you said, it's everywhere. It is what you said it was, you know, and then move into solutions. And we talked about these PLCs. You know, that was our vision for this year. We, we redid the training for our principals and assistant principals in semester one. Semester two, we put it into action. Um, with the idea that it has to be a sense of urgency. Right. Um, there's got to be some change immediately. Yes. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Okay. Is there anything else? Mr. Handy, I want to thank you and the committee that worked on putting this great presentation together for us today. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to you doing something else. It's very <laughs> soon. <laughs> this was really good and really significant. OK, now the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday, the 13th, 2023 at 4 p.m.
The next Equity Committee meeting with the Equity Council will be held on Thursday, May 25th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Is there any further business? All right, if there is no further business, then the meeting is adjourned and I thank you everyone for joining us. Take Have care. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Take thank care. You.